welcome. This is the Practical Thinking Hour. Um, this is a, something different that we do within Practical Thinking. We uh, aim to combine the strategic, technical, and interpersonal perspective in this conversation. Um, this aims to be a conversation that's not a one-way sending webinar. We aim it to combine our, those three perspectives into the conversation and um, this way, we um, we want to change a little bit the online event uh, that exists. We uh, want to buy, combine topics. So, for example, today we're combining agile and organizational culture, but we have and will be in the future combining strategy and change management, um, back on track project management, uh, project maturity, etc. Um, and we'll do that using the different perspectives, being practical and less theoretical. Um, and we aim at combining um, our knowledge and experience in this conversation. The idea is also that you engage in this conversation. There's, uh, again, it's a, not a one-way conversation. It's not a one-way webinar, webinar where we will be sending you information. Uh, we'll get the most fun and the most, um, this will be the most fun and inspiring hour, I believe, if we all engage in this conversation. Uh, there's a few um, rules for today's Practical Thinking Hour. Um, as mentioned, you are invited to participate, or basically you should participate to make the most of it. Um, you can raise your hand, so if you see there's a little icon with a little hand, you can raise that to request to speak. Um, and then I will give you, uh, option, uh, I'll give you the right to speak, and uh, if you can, turn your video on so we can also see your pretty face. Uh, if you do not like to speak but do want to participate, please use the chat and I'll be reading what's going on there and make sure that gets into the conversation as well. You can claim one PDU, PDU for this after the webinar. We will send you the link of the recording afterwards. There. Let me introduce you, Annie, and um, let me introduce you a little bit uh, more about practical thinking. I'll start with practical thinking, actually. We are a... Um, I like to call us a network organization. I'm not sure if everyone in my company agrees with that, but what we are is a combination of experts um, from different or experts on different topics and perspectives. So I am the global thinker of organizational uh, organizational anthropology. So I focus on organizational culture, but we have an expert on project management. We have experts on um, uh, change management, and we combine these knowledges and experiences in the um, in the assignments we get from companies which makes that we're not just focusing on one technical part. We also include the strategical and interpersonal perspective on all the jobs that we do in companies. We are um, based in Miami, Mexico, uh, let me think, Peru, Bolivia, um, Brazil, and here in Australia. We're a little bit new. It has all to do with me moving to Australia recently, and Annie is... Um, uh, has approached us as an agile project management expert expert and today we're doing this webinar based on her expertise or basically what you're going to do or you're going to be able to do is use her experience and expertise to see what you can uh, or cannot do in the agile environment Annie is an international expert or, uh, expert in agile project management and Annie maybe you want to explain why your experience is so important in today's topic Thank you, Karen. Um, so primarily, I, I've managed to see the full range of agile ways of working over my 25 plus year um, career. I started off as a coder. And this includes places like Google and Facebook, where they don't even use the word agile. They just they just are. And um, what I've seen in Australia in particular is this energetic desire by a lot of companies, whether they're large corporates or small not-for-profits, um, to capitalize on those promises of Agile. And what I've seen is some amazing results. Um, and then I've seen so, some not so amazing results. And that's really why Karen and I are, are, are talking, which is about what are the mm -hmm. cultural aspects um, of that versus the, the the technical, so I'm really interested to hear from our participants what their 
experience has been um, and what you see as as fixes or remedies or what agile means to you. So that's that's enough for me. Thank you very much. That's a really good introduction. Now, everyone has, for this to be a different webinar, everyone has received uh, material, pre-event material. Sometimes that's a case, sometimes that's uh, an article to, from us, you received a presentation and an article. Um, I'm curious to know uh, whether you've read that, whether you want a recap of the, um, of the material. Um, so let's do a quick, raise your hand. Have you read the material? Have you seen the material? Please let me know. I also see that we have people from California, Miami. Well, uh, I assume Kate is Australian, Annie, but you would know. Kate is, yes. Uh. <laughs> I get no raised hands, so that sound that sounds like no one has actually read the pre-event material, uh, which is uh, not to my surprise. There, uh, David confirms he hasn't seen it. Um, that's all right, actually. Uh, we'll we'll use some of the slides that we have. You you can also use the material for after the event. There's no problem. Um, but Annie, maybe we'll start with the poll to find a little to learn a little more about our audience. Is that uh, a good uh, idea? Yes, no, that would be great. So okay. we just um, so we're curious yeah. to know what uh, roles are in the audience today. Now I have published the poll, but I can't see it myself. Can you see it, Annie, or can anyone let me know in the chat whether it's visible? Can't see it. You can't see it, but maybe that's because you're an admin oh, administrator. Okay, they voted. So we've got 67% project management professionals. No, they're oh, still voting. Wait a second. <laughs> wait a second. <laughs> wait a second. <laughs> we have also a few more people entering the room now, which, mm. uh, which is good. So welcome, everyone. For those who've missed the introduction, this is Annie. Uh, she's our international expert in, um, in Agile project management. My name is Karen. I'm a global thinker at uh, on organizational culture at Practical Thinking. Uh, I think we have a vote now. We have mm -hmm. 60, so I'll, I'll see if I can actually publish the, no, I don't think I can publish anymore, uh, but we mm -hmm. had 67% of project management professionals, 17% of consultants, and some people's job was not listed, but there's no agile coach here, Annie, apparently, uh, or no one. No one presenting <laughs> itself as Agile coach or a technology professional. I don't know how you feel about that, but what do you want to do with these results? Uh, well, it helps us to gear the presentation. So I'm, I'm not expecting too many technical questions based on that. Um, just um, I think that's fine. We can continue, but um, it's good to know who the types of people that we're talking to today. Um, so would you like me to very quickly recap on the presentation and the the handout? I think um, uh, I actually just from my own experience or knowledge or whatever, we've been talking a little bit, but I'm still struggling mm -hmm. to find out whether Agile is something new or whether it already has been there. Like it's so up in the air recently. Can you, mm -hmm. um, can you say something about that? So... The key thing really with Agile is the, the word Agile didn't get coined as a delivery phrase until the Agile Manifesto got written in 2001. And for, for those of us that started work before 2001, especially in, in technology, there were lots of different incremental methods of delivery, uh, including you know rapid application development, um, and a lot of PC programming really embraced Agile principles. Obviously, it started maturing. And then really what I've seen in terms of global trends and companies getting nervous, particularly in, um, you know, noticing in Australia, um, was all of the small technology companies that are nibbling away at the large corporations offering automated solutions. And then there was a flip from technology to business where this phrase, new ways of working, agile ways of working has become popular. And I think just about every large corporate over the last four, four years has been, um, 
invaded with consultants offering agile as the as the the golden chalice or the silver bullet um and coming from a technology background but having you know run away from it for a, a few years ago um but married to a technologist as well is are we taking a predominantly software based principle and trying to apply it wholesale to organizations you know what are people struggling with who haven't really thought about technology and what does agile really mean so that's kind of key point number one it's it's not new but people i i my theory is people are trying to get their business people are trying to get their heads around it and i think people are tripping over themselves and getting confused and maybe making it over complicated be interested to know what other people think um all right let's will, uh let's see if other people have, have an opinion question. yeah I'm going to stop sharing that for now and we'll come back to and just see what you guys have got to. I think someone say. wanted to say something, but I'm not sure if that worked out well. Can you maybe please raise your hand first? Uh, nope. Or there was just a twitch in the audio. Um, anyway, uh, any comments on what Annie just said? Uh, said she said agile is not really new. It's something that's already been there, but now packaged nicely. If that's uh, if I say that correctly, Annie. Anyone? Or no? Then Does do you anybody... want to continue? Go ahead, Annie. No, that's fine. Do you, does anybody have a violent opinion on that? Or should we just move on? <laughs> Maybe everyone just agrees. Okay. I mean, I, it's the same with design thinking, but that's a different topic. We'll do that in a different webinar, actually. Um, okay. And you also had uh, examples of agiles going wrong. I'm not sure if that's where you would like to go now. Or um, Yes. Yeah, so if some of the... Some of what I've seen, and I'm trying to move through this presentation, sorry. Um, so I, um, I wanted to re-emphasize as well about businesses trying to replicate Agile and seize on those entre entrepreneurial spirits. So that's, that's slide 10, and you, you will be sent a copy of this deck. What mm -hmm. I see more of is... Um, moving to slide 17 which is what i call um fragile or vanity agile um and i see this in organizations that really want success without the work now the other article that you got sent was strategy for the fat smoker and it's a really with a very well recognized strategy document and it really talks about uh, from a human empathy position of understanding why it's really easy to run strategy days and get everybody really excited about the promise of the strategy but then there's that emotional letdown <laughs> when there comes the dawning realization that you've actually got to have plans and execute on those plans and have some delivered outcomes to realize the strategy um so I've, I've gone up sorry I've, I've, I've jiggled the page so um and then yes actually that sort of kind of does segue a bit into the optimism bias you've got this lovely published strategy and you think it's just going to be as simple as um you know a roadmap on a on a page or a poster on a wall but then reality sinks in particularly with inexperienced sponsors and leaders who are inexperienced in delivery and they don't, you know, recognize that the the reality is, you know, a, a much higher hill to climb and those waters might be shark infested. And I see that reflected in Agile. Um, it's, you know, you go to a day's worth of training and you think you, you've, you know, you can do Agile or you can be Agile and not realize that it's actually, um, you know, a, a journey and you need to be, persistent and consistent with it like any methodology or, or any discipline and that's really 
the nuts and bolts of what we've we've got here and, and Karen's got some great questions um at the end. We talk about toxic culture, we talk about essential ingredients in the in the pack. Um there's a reference as well to Patrick Lencioni's book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And really if you've got a healthy agile environment, you you reap the benefits over on the right. So, you know, you've built a solid foundation of trust. You ask healthy questions in mind for conflict. Everyone's turning up, sponsors, business owners, SMEs, the team, and showing the uh, commitment, demonstrating accountability, and then you get the results. Um, if people aren't turning up in the first place, then you get more of the behaviors on the, on the left. Um, and then Karen's got some great things about adjusting a, a, um, a toxic culture. So that's kind of the helicopter view and allow you to, to read it, um, in more, more detail after, afterwards. Um, but we'll be really interested in, in hearing some, some thoughts and, um, comments. Um, and I particularly would like to hear about the the fragile stuff so that um success without the work do you see this happening in your environments or is it all you know you're doing agile and everybody's trying their best and maybe you're getting stuck so i'd really love to hear from you i'm gonna stop sharing that now and wait for um some questions Comments. So what people can do who are in a com on their computer, they have the option to raise their hand or actually it says um, request to speak. Um, if you raise your hand or request to speak, we can give you um, access as a speaker in this, uh, in this um, event and you'll get to speak and share your ideas with, with us. If you are not on a cell phone, or if you are not on a computer but on a cell phone, then please write your comments in a chat. Uh, I just received one that I will be reading in a little bit. From Sajid, um, yes, excellent. So we can um, share that with everyone and uh, continue the discussion. So indeed, Sajid says, or ask actually Annie, what are the signs to look for when the Agile is being rolled out? As in the start where one says, give it time, but in six months time, it's often too late. What's your comment on that? So I think that's a great question. Um, I, so my stock standard answer is it depends. So, um, I think let's make the assumptions that you're not, you, you're in an environment where the workplace culture is positive and people want the change. And it's generally a healthy culture where people are turning up to work. There's good camaraderie. There's a good level of trust and you know, your organizational culture is positive. I would argue if you've got decent agile coaching and you've got good commitment from the executive leadership, you can have a result um, within four months. So get, allow about a month to do some setup. And I don't, I don't think it matters how big the organization is. If you allow about a month to do some setup, you can run, um, at least one decent agile experiment over the next three months and have some proof points. And my argument would be have a go at some of your, what you could, what you can feasibly do in um, 60 days or less and maybe have two or three that you're having a go at and, and practice and, and have the, the disciplines. Do you mean two uh, or three projects? Two or three smaller initiatives, pieces right. of work. So if it's a project, you know, what are you defining as a project in your space? Because if it's something that's going to be big, you re and people are cynical about it or they're, they're wanting to take a chance, that's probably not the right thing to start with. My key recommendation with experimentation is it's a bit like getting, um, you know, a five year old to learn to ride a bike. You want to give them some support and encouragement. You don't want to pack them off, you know, on a, on a chopper on a highway on day one. You want to kind of gradually build it up, give them some confidence. And then they're, you know, freewheeling with confidence. And, and then you can say, look, it's, it, it's worked. Um, if it is a larger piece of work, 
if the executive are backing it and they're saying it's the most important, six months is nothing. You know, nine months. Um, I've seen examples when, you know, they've given a whole project a go for nine months. We've got to do it this way because we've tried it three other different ways and it didn't work. And they did it for the nine months and it worked and it was delightful. And, you know, roll out the red carpet and open the champagne. And can you, Annie, can so, you also um, be very practical and say what kind of signs to look for like when Agile is being rolled out, like what signs do you look for when to know when it goes wrong or how do you know it's going right? So probably the my top thing is have a team that cares and is willing to give it a go and have at least two executive leaders um, that will just say, we're doing this and they'll turn up and they'll go into bat for the team. So that sponsorship. Um, and particularly, so I'll give you an example. When I worked at JB Weir the last time, so uh, uh, where at what where? So J, so JB Weir and Son, they are a uh, an investment advisory firm and wholly owned by uh, National Australia Bank, and they've been in business for 175 years. Mm -hmm. so when I implemented um, agile ways of working there. The CEO backed it and the COO um, backed it. The CEO had, had never worked on a successful project <laughs> in that environment. And he just said, we've just got to give it a go. And I trust you. Let's, let's just, let's give it a go. And any of the naysayers on his leadership team that were saying, we don't want to do this. It's too hard or it's too time consuming. He basically said, be quiet. We're doing it. You've got to turn up and you've got to turn up for this amount of time. And we'll listen to you along the way, but we've got to give this a go. Now, if you don't have that, it's difficult because you can be sabotaged before you've even started. started. Right. So, yeah. and it's a bit like going back to that bike riding example. Um, I've got two sons. My eldest son, he took three years <laughs> to ride a bike without training wheels. Um, and it took bike ed camp and a lot of cheering on for, for him to actually get on a bike. Whereas our younger one, he trusted us. He had a go. He had a go himself. And, you know, he was he was riding a bike without training wheels within a couple of hours. So I think if you've got faith and you're going to go for it, it will happen. But if you're right. doubting yourself constantly, it will collapse. Right. Thank you very Does much. That, I think that's a very helpful answer, Annie. Um, you also... Um, uh, wanted to put a poll up with uh, a question for the audience. Is this a good time, you think? I think that would be great. And see, All guys, right. see what you, ladies and gentlemen, see what you think. I love how you see how you mentioned, I call them ladies and gentlemen. Uh, again, I can't see it, but let me know um, whether it's up there, Annie. Um, let's go to polls. It is. It's up. The, the question is whether everyone else can see it. <laughs> Not already. You, you can see it because you're the uh, uh, you're the administrator of this call. Can everyone see the poll? Then please start answering the question. I know it takes some time to think about it. Oh, there we go. So I guess people can see it because we got one answer already. Let, let's wait for a few more people to answer. The question is. A subject matter expert is assigned to your program 16 hours a week. That's 40%. Over the past four weeks, they've only been able to contribute eight hours in total, which is 5%. Four out of five of your sprints are now blocked. Uh-oh. What do you do? And we have four answers options for you. Report this to the project sponsor. Get them to resolve it. Oh, that's an interesting one. Get them to resolve it. Document and explain the impact of the SME absence. You have to explain to me what SME is, Annie. Uh, accept it. Experts. All right, thank you. Accept it and keep working on the unblocked sprint. Well, no one votes for that. Ask to be resigned to, the, to another project. Oh, yeah, that's also a, an option. <laughs> but um, we don't have anyone who dares to say uh, that as an answer. Now, before I close the poll, Annie, um, would you want to say something about it? Shall we ask the audience to um, share their experiences with us? Uh, yes, I, I would love to hear from someone. If anyone can speak, what would, 
why would you report it to the the sponsor? I'd like to hear that, and I'd like to hear that what you'd get out of documenting and explaining. And then I'll I'll tell you what I've seen. <laughs> anyway, I see David, who already told me he's on a cell phone, so he can't speak because he's not on a computer. Uh, he says sometimes some teams go through the agile motion. How can you get buy-in by team members? Uh, and he also responds to that actually. Apathy seems to be a problem. What's your take mm. on that, Annie? Is is that a relation to this poll? The poll, and what would you um, respond to it? So, actually, I think that's an excellent question, David, because the the textbook answer to this in Agile is that you would report this to the sponsor because they're supposed to be championing your project and clear the roadblock. And you're making an assumption that you've done everything that you can to resolve it yourself. And then you're escalating and getting them to, to clear it. Now, I have seen that in, in healthy cultures. Um, what I've seen in not so healthy and courageous environments is the documenting and explaining it, the impact, which is legitimate, by the way, as well. And I think that you should actually do both of those. You should document it and explain the impact and say, look, I've tried to resolve it these ways and then, you know, report it up. But what I've actually seen in more than one environment is more of, you know, when, when the environment's not good and people won't help you and your, your sponsor won't help, is people accept it and keep working on the unblocked sprint. So that's the fake agile. You're actually not supposed to do that at all. You are supposed to, the, all of the team are supposed to progressively help clear out um, the block sprint. Um, and then what I see is when, as people start to lose hope and sanity, they ask to be reassigned to another project because they go, I can't work on this anymore. So that's what I've seen. Um, and in healthy spaces, I think you should always document it and explain the impact because then you've got an audit trail and because then you're not looking hysterical as well to your sponsor, product owner, executive leadership, and you're trying to resolve it sort of all, all the way through. David is commenting. He says, this is what we do. We also document it. But a lot of time it's CYA. Do you know that um, everything? Yes, indeed. Indeed. Oh, yeah. I learned <laughs> that in the Panama Canal, actually. That, yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, any comments on that? Anyone else who wants to um, to add? Uh, I believe Kate was active. Kate, do you want to share your opinion here? If you can. Kate's not there. Uh, or afraid to speak. Annie, um, I also wanted to ask you what I thought was interesting on your slide deck is that sometimes, well, like you speak about fake agile and you call that fragile uh, environment, um, then what, what is really going wrong in this, in this agile or fake oh, Kate agile? Is trying to speak. Kate is trying to speak. Should we give her another try? Yes. Have you, would you like to? Yes, of course. I, get... I just did, I think. Kate, can you speak? You might have to install something, actually. Uh, but I did give you the right to speak. We'll wait a little bit for her to connect. I think she can speak now. At least I, I hit the green button for her to speak. Um, if she's not there in a couple of minutes, we'll, uh, we'll try again. Annie, in the meantime, in your slide deck, um, you say, you talk about the fragile, or the fake agile, and you call mm -hmm. that fragile environment. Mm -hmm. And you say, so what's going, what's really going wrong in this, in this, in this environment? What, what do you then mean by exploring the cultural challenges? Um, so I'm going to quote another agile coach who he's actually working at ANZ at the moment. His name's Chris Chan, and he's also worked at National Australia Bank. Um, he was the one that I first heard the phrase vanity agile, and I called it um, fragile. And it is really where you have the post motivational posters on the wall, but actually none of the routines and rituals are being followed, and there's there's no trust. Um, it looks trust. like a, it looks like it might look like a Disneyland theme park <laughs> in your office, 
but actually you peel away the wallpaper and there's nothing. Um, so I've been in places where they have huge visual management boards, but they're not updated. Nobody's actually, it's all eye candy. People aren't actually going and having regular stand-ups or having those connected conversations or, mm -hmm. you know, moving the cards on the wall. Um, right. Well, and, all these uh, cards on the wall are just uh, very yeah. nice phrases defined by some higher management, whereas yes. in the office they're not the real practices or the real values of the yes. people in that culture. Yes, and um, I, I, the values piece I think is really important. Um, you know, I've I've been privileged to work in probably two organizations which really lived their values. So Disney was one, and JB Weir, who I've mentioned before, was another one. And mm -hmm. you know, they talk about client first, and they they have been client first for over one hundred and seventy five years, and they really mean it. And then I was working for other organizations that said, "Oh, you know, we put the customers at the heart of everything we do," and we know yeah, it like isn't. The like, the <laughs> like the like the Telstra Internet Company in Australia here. David also recognizes this. Uh, he says this sounds like me going through the motions comment I'm talking yes, about. <laughs> absolutely, David. It's absolutely it's that. And um, probably what I I see as the root cause is if you've got the CEO who's saying they're doing it, but they're not really, and it's all about them, then that's what. <laughs> That's now, David, kind of... David is wondering okay. whether he sounds like a really negative story. Is it is it that bad, Annie? <laughs> Circles back to ap apathy. Uh, I think maybe you should be giving some tips, Karen, in terms of how do you get the circuit breakers in place? Because this is probably moving more to your area of expertise because, um, you know, I haven't been successful every time, and that's that's the other thing. And um, you know, in in projects, I've had I've had a few that haven't gone well, I think and a few and a few sponsors that you haven't been able to turn. So when do you push, and when do what do you try, and when do you when do you just walk away and just go, you I know, think, I've done all I can, and I'm I'm leaving now. Mm. I think um, uh, I, I think very much, many things, but I, first of all, I think uh, you can't expect expect yourself to always be successful anywhere you are because you're never doing it alone. You work with other people and working with people is the most difficult thing there is in the world. It would be very easy if we could do it all by ourselves, but unfortunately we need other people for various reasons. Um, now in companies, there's often a lack of building that collaborative relationship and focusing on building a relationship between people, between departments, with other companies that either are customers or client, or that are clients or uh, shareholders or uh, whatever relationship there is, we often don't spend as much time as we should to to really build a collaborative relationship, to really, really work together on a goal that we both have in mind or is like a shared goal would even be better. Now also mm -hmm. uh, in the material, I listed five uh, warning signs for the toxic work culture. And that's, mm -hmm. um, and I think a few of me mentioned here already, how you mentioned lack of trust, uh, poor communication. Mm -hmm. You, you mentioned some malfunctional, malfunctioning leaders or sponsors. Um, uh, you mentioned the disengagement and I think the disengagement or the unmotivated employees is one that's really important. If you want to be successful, you need people to be engaged and motivated. So you need them to have that same view as you, or at least that same goal in mind. They don't have to have mm -hmm. the same view. They need to have the same goal. Mm -hmm. um, and deadlines and workloads should really be realistic. And it's, it's, that often is a problem because we, mm -hmm. like, in some levels of project management, and there's many examples I've seen where people design a project or a program and set certain goals without actually knowing what really needs to be done to achieve those goal goals. So that, mm -hmm. um, uh, that creates that workloads are a lot higher and uh, too high of workloads is, has a negative effect on our employees, of course. Mm -hmm. So um, it's really important to, to keep an eye out for the, those warning signs for a toxic culture. Now, if you realize there is a toxic culture, I think my main message is it can be solved, 
Mm -hmm. um, however, maybe not as fast as you want the project to finish because mm. changing a culture takes time and um, finishing a project does too, but often projects are shorter than you have the time to change a culture. Mm. Uh, if you actually can change a culture, but that's a whole different topic. I think you can adjust it, not change it. Yes. What I do believe is what you can do when you want to adjust a toxic culture is start by identifying the problem behavior. So see what's going on, what kind of behavior you see in the environment that is not working well for this project, that's not working well for the collaboration amongst the team, the collaboration with the client or with the sponsor. Um, it's mm. important to um, realize what are the true shared values. So not those that are on the wall, not those Indeed. that are designed. What, what are really being lived, yes. Exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. The, yeah. The, the values yeah. that are lived and, and, and what is it that motivates people to work in this project, to work towards that common goal? Mm. Um, and what actions can we uh, put in place or how can we support those behaviors? And I think this is a really big part in adjusting any culture. Um, mm -hmm. It's also very practical. It's not, mm. uh, it's not very, it's very difficult to think of, but it's not very difficult to put into practice because basically it's very important to walk the talk. So if you want people mm -hmm. to be diff different, yes. you have to show. Model the um, right behavior. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you should model that right, that behavior, yeah. yeah. Um, now, I've seen a couple of questions here. So we've got one from Corinne, yeah. one from Kate, a sponsor who's toxic. How do you, how do you, the issues you're raising within the Agile environment are different from Waterfall? So well, let's, start with the, let's start with the one from Lynn. How do you issue, how do the issues you are raising with the Agile environment differ, differ from Waterfall? I like that question, Annie, but it's yours to answer. <laughs> um, so Lynn. I actually don't think there is any difference. I think that um, in terms of raising raising them, the the difference should be in an agile environment that you have um, a clearly defined business owner, and they're often called a product owner. They might be called the sponsor or a business SME, but they are the person that is championing that um, that project, you're very clear in an agile environment. Well, typically you're using visual management boards and you're using um, either a tool like Jira um, or Trello, which has got your story cards on them. And you, it's very clear to see who's owning a piece of work, how far along it is, whether it's in the backlog, it's in progress, it's done or it's blocked. And um, the idea is within those routines and rituals of, of having those those stand ups that issues are raised to say you know this is this is blocked or this is coming up this has happened, and then it's keeping those those issues logged. I think that the difference in um, an agile environment from waterfall is that you're getting the team you're typically getting the team together on a daily basis, and you're typically in a better position able to address aged issues and you're able to see the impact of an unresolved issue much more quickly so that's what i think the benefit is of um, an agile environment over a waterfall one um uh but i don't really think that how you treat them or deal with them is any different it's just dealing with you know being able to deal with them in a more speedy fashion because you see the impact more readily that's that's it yeah, I think I, I can only uh, underline that the way you deal with the the, the issues is the same. This is just I don't know if method is the right word or the technique yeah. that you use is different, uh, agile or uh, or waterfall. And Lynn, uh, yeah. thanking you for your answer. Um, <laughs> you agree? Thanks. So Corinne and Kate. Corinne. I like Corinne's question too. Corinne asks whether um, whether we have any recommendation on how to effectively coach sponsorship group in a fragile environment, especially for inexperienced uh, sponsors or not know sponsors, inexperienced people or sponsors not know how to engage their team. Okay, and and Kate's got a question on pro, on pro, toxic oh, sponsors as well. Sponsor. So, so I've got this little sheet on a piece of work that I did a few <laughs> years ago on sponsor personas. So I have worked with a lot of sponsors, coached them, and I uh, developed a 
a sponsor capability development program with sponsors for sponsors a few years ago. And we've basically got in this two, four, seven different sponsor personas. And the majority, I think that the majority of project managers and the majority of business leaders um, assume that they're all brilliant as sponsors by osmosis. They don't actually <laughs> think that there's any skill or work involved. From there. And then they have a bit of a shock. So I have a slightly different view. And I view that there's the middle three sponsors are, they've got no project management experience, but they want to have their projects to go well and to have Annie, great outcomes. Yeah. Annie, may I pause you here? You say the middle three, but we have no idea what the oh, range sorry. is or what sorry. that means. So the so what we've got at the top level is we've got a role model sponsor. How many do we have? Uh, we've got seven altogether. So we've got a role model sponsor. And beyond the role model sponsor, you've got somebody who can be a transformation sponsor or a massive program sponsor who's mm -hmm. been there, done that, and will coach other sponsors. And the role model sponsor is somebody that's had experience as a sponsor, has got great people skills, takes ownership of the project, is present, clears roadblocks, um, so wait a second, because I don't think it's it's a good. Making. I don't think it's a good time to describe all the roles now. But okay, just, sure. to, just to get an idea, like you have the role model sponsor on one end and the transformational and the, sponsor on the other hand. So we've got two, two, two up the top end, and then in the middle you've got basically people who are new to sponsorship, and they might be reluctant, they might be struggling, or they might have been a sponsor in another organization, but don't know how projects work here. And they're all the ones that are coachable and want to learn. So all of those top five, they might be at different levels of experience, but they want to learn and they don't know that what they don't know. And I think it's, you know, an agile coach's job so, or a pro program manager's job to coach them. But let's make this practical then. Then if, the, if, if the, those are the, like, if these are the, people that you're talking about, they seem to be fitting Corrine's characteristics. What recommendations do you have to effectively coach these people in a fragile environment? And I'm curious whether it's actually possible to coach when you're working in a fragile environment or should you focus on the environment first? So I think that's a good question. Um, it, I think it depends on your own experience and how robust you are and how much reserve you've got and how well resourced you are. So there is a phrase, um, put on your own oxygen mask before you assist others. So if you feel that the environment is fragile, but you are coping and you've got the energy and the resources to help that person, or you know, you can get somebody in to help that person and coach them, maybe send them on a sponsorship coaching program and then you can guide them and direct them in what it is that they need to do and you you work on your relationship with them and just say look we're in this together so that's the top tip that without any training is like we're in this together I want to help you can can we help each other so we can be successful and I think it's a grab them by the hand go out for coffee or gin or whatever it is that you'd like to do in your workplace um, but build that relationship if they're into cycling you know find out about cycling find that common ground that you can build a relationship and say right we we need to do this together I'm struggling with this I need your help with that and you help them and you basically like an air traffic controller and you're you're guiding them um, and there are sponsorship training programs out there um, and if they care about it they will they will turn up and they will learn. And I've worked with some brilliant people who we thought were completely unteachable, who've turned out to be role models over time. And how do you, they, how do you, they thank you. How do you, like, how do you know they're role models in the end? Or I don't know. We, get them, we did evaluations and criteria and got assessments done by their teams. So, um, you know, and there was one guy in particular, he went from, you know, he thought he was amazing and his team didn't. Mm -hmm. And then less than 12 months later, it was phase two of the program. 
he redid the assessment and I said, how do you think you went? And he said, well, I don't know. I thought I did all right the last time. He said, and I didn't do that well. And I'm a bit scared to hear the results. <laughs> and actually he went, he went to being a role model and he's coached a whole load of other sponsors. He's at National Australia Bank and he's actually coached my, my husband as well as a sponsor. So, um, you know, there's, there's nice stories in it, but some of them are uncoachable. And this goes to Kate's point about the toxic dealing, project sponsor. dealing with toxic ones. So at the bottom end of the scale, we've got bad sponsors and they are people, they don't turn up or they don't turn up prepared to a meeting. Then, they don't have time for the team. How do you deal with those? Because you can't ignore them. So if there's any, if they've got any level of human pride <laughs> in learning and doing well, you can get to them. So the way that you can convert them is that you influence people that influence them if you can't actually directly influence them. And you can get another sponsor or another executive leader to influence them. But some... So you need to know their, you need to know, you need to know them very well and you need to know how someone else can influence them if you can't do it yourself. Is that right. what you're saying? So you need to know what matters to them and find the trigger. So we had somebody that went from a bad sponsor because he wouldn't turn up and he only trusted like about three people. And then we got to him by finding somebody who was one of his advisors and saying, what matters to this guy? And he said, if you can highlight the benefits and what's in it for him, the financial benefits, you'll have that guy eating out of your hands. And so we did, and that's what we did. And he turned around and he ended up being a role model sponsor. So and he thanked us again for, you know, thank you for, for keeping me on my toes and pointing out my bad behavior. So, you know, so there, there's hope. But there is a bottom category, um, Kate, Corinne, and everybody, which is a should never be a sponsor. And but what if they are? You, know, you can't take them what out if of your they project. Are? Well, um the thing is you this is where david's tip about you document stuff and you just keep records and it is painful i know it's painful but you if you have a good reputation yourself and you've got credit behind you you can use your networks relationships and influence to subtly ask the questions to go look i'm noticing this behavior what can we what can we do to turn that to turn that around? And sometimes, you know, I've had my gut on two people that I thought were beyond hope, but you persist anyway. You try to give them their opportunities, and then you go, look, seriously, we've been at this for nine months, and there's two hundred people complaining about them. <laughs> really, can you make sure they're never a sponsor again? Because it's, you know, that they upset so many people, and the impact is all these people leave, and it costs you X million. You know, what What do you want to do? And I mean, at the end of the day, most of us as project professionals, because I, I wasn't sure if there were any executive leaders in this in this call, um, but most of us as project professionals, we don't have the power to fire a sponsor. We only have a power, the power to work with them, try to influence them as best as we can. And then if they're really being toxic, um, particularly if there's any sort of illegal behaviors they're going against the values you know there's harassment there's bullying i would be reporting it and that is desperately toxic and i've been fortunate not to work in that sort of environment so far is that when you request to be assigned to another project <laughs> uh yes i think um at the end of the day you've got to decide how hard you want to battle for something um i mean i actually ended up refusing to work with the, the two worst people that I dealt with. So there was one guy, well, both of them loved me and they wanted me to coach them. And I just said, no, <laughs> it's not happening. I'm not running any more for this guy and I'm not giving any more to this um, woman. I'm not doing it. I said, look, I've tried this this many times. I said, it's not worth it. I don't believe that there's gonna be any change. So what's the point? Well, you leave the and job. I like, to I, I like Kate's comment, you know, you, or, you know, thank, or you leave the job, you know. So sometimes you don't want to trade your sanity for this constant meanness or whatever no. it is, toxicity. 
Annie, so thank you very much. We have right. eight more minutes, and I would like mm -hmm. to see if anyone in the uh, in the audience has uh, questions for for us uh, before we we finish. We still have some time, but um, uh, yeah, send us your questions in the chat or um, share us your experience. We're really curious to hear your experience. Do you have you ever worked in a toxic environment or a fragile environment? Or is this something really weird that we're talking about? <laughs> I'm sure um, you have ideas here. That'd be great. Got a yes. What's that? David says a yes. David, share your experience. Write a long chat if you want. I'll read it out loud. Um, uh, what's your experience? Oh, David says it's actually common. So I'm glad to hear we're not something, saying something really odd here. This, this um, is interesting, actually. I said this to Karen a few weeks ago. I said, I think maybe I was spoiled. <laughs> I've worked in a few environments that are really terrible. So uh, I've gone, ooh. So this is what's led me to putting this up anyway. And here we are. And there's quite a few people in who are interested in this topic. So I um, mm. I'm assume it's pretty common, Annie. I think. Uh, People will want to learn from um, from what we can do in a fragile environment. Um, any questions before we start uh, wrapping up the call? Any um, any ideas you would like to share? Hutch, we haven't heard much from you. Sajid might want to say something. Yeah. All right, David mm -hmm. writes, David says, I think it's common to, I assume that's about the toxic environment, mm -hmm. when management flaps their gums and just do it because they were told to do. And do you recognize that? Yes, I do. And um, this is what I've, <sighs> this is what I see as ANZ Bank doing differently. That's the Australian New Zealand. No, it's just called ANZ, but Australia New Zealand Bank. It's one of the four large banks in Australia. Um, their CEO went off. He wanted to do agile throughout the organization. So he wanted an agile cultural transformation as well as a tech transformation. He joined and he immediately took his leadership team off to Amsterdam. Um, possibly for some ash, yes, <laughs> but uh, for a whole agile immersion and whole wanted to learn from toxic the world, environment world, in the first world place. World leaders. <laughs> and then he, um, you know, they started it from the top down and then they've seeded it with, with agile um, teams. Now they're, they're also having challenges, but the guy's really sincere. He's modeling the right behaviors. So he's, he's ticking the boxes, he's leading the way. He's working with people like Carol Dweck, who's the author of Mindset. So she's one of the world's leading psychologists and talks about a growth mindset, which I totally love and agree with and view that that's really, that's the foundational piece in the, on the agile mindset. Um, what does that mean? That, I don't think everyone has read the book. Can you so tell the the one sentence? Is, the, just a one sentence explanation of what the growth sure. mindset is. So uh, there's two ends to the mindset. One's the fixed mindset is that no matter what you do, you're born with a set amount of talent and IQ. And growth mindset is you can constantly evolve your IQ and learn new skills. And that's what agile is about, you know, adapting, changing, learning, continuous learning. What culture is. Culture doesn't mm. stop ever. It's, it's mm. not something that it's dynamic all the time. Mm. But I guess that, that connects with the growth mindset. Yeah, but what I see is what David's talking about, keeps going back to that vanity, agile, success without the work. They want the success, but they're not prepared to do in the work, but they've been told they need to do it by often a some consulting company. Um, and then it goes back to the whole strategy for this fat smoker. You know, you know that if you give up smoking, and they hope you a healthy diet and exercise, you're going to live for longer. <laughs> but you still don't want to do it because you enjoy smoking and you enjoy that sugar donut. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. So, you know, what do you want? 
Um, again, Annie, thank you so much for your time and preparation uh, to put the material together, to share your experiences with us, to um, uh, share some of your uh, uh, knowledge here. I want to thank everyone for being here, uh, especially David, who is awake at 3 a.m. in California, so he needs some coffee and donuts. Um, good night for everyone here in Australia. Uh, good afternoon for everyone in Europe. Uh, thank you all. Everyone is saying thank you in the chat to you, Annie. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. And we hope to Thanks. see you uh, uh, again anytime soon. You will receive the link and please um, apply for your PDU if you want uh, at PMI. Thank you, everyone. We're going to close this call now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Take care. Bye.